Good morning, everybody. Please be seated. My name is Choi, and I will serve as moderator of this second session. As moderator, I'd like to briefly explain in three, four minutes the context of our discussion. This session will pick up where the previous one left, out, left off, East Asia. From East Asia, we will be zeroing in on Northeast and the Korean Peninsula. So in a nutshell, we are gathered here to discuss and reflect on the future of East Asia, Northeast Asia, and the Korean Peninsula. Why? Why are they important to us? The rise of East Asia would be recorded in history as the most significant phenomenon of the second half of the 20th century along with the Cold War. East Asia accounted for only 10% of the global economic output after the Second World War. Now, it accounts more than 25%. This historic rise enabled East Asia to serve perhaps as the engine of the growth of world economy in the 21st century. Looking into the future, it is important to bear in mind that East Asia has about 1.6 billion people with a culture to the emphasis on education, hard work, thrift, and deferred gratification. By virtue of this, many ex experts predict that East Asia will serve as the main engine of world economic growth in, the, in this century. As such, East Asia appears to promise a broad future for itself as well as to the entire world. The Korean Peninsula is a case in point. It is situated at the heart of the Northeast Asia and it served traditionally as an invasion route for the hegemonic power that was in the past. But now it has become a route for communication and commerce and a conduit of prosperity. For example, before South Korea and China normalized their relations in 1992, the trade volume was negligible and there is not a single direct flight between the two countries. As of last year, however, the trade volume between the two countries surpassed $250 billion and the number of direct flights between the two countries exceeded 840 per week. What is remarkable is that all these positive develop developments took place along with Korea's strengthening its alliance with the United States, maintaining, albeit some frictions, its mutually beneficial relations with Japan in trade, tourism, and cultural exchanges, and developing its good relations with Russia. However, this very positive evolution in the Northeast Asia can be maintained only when we manage successfully a number of issues in the region, including territorial and historical issues. At the same time, most of us can agree that the North Korean problem, along with its nuclear issue, constitutes the single most serious problem facing North Korea, uh, <coughs> Northeast Asia. While South Korea has been evolving rapidly, North Korea remained frozen in history. Its relation with China is, again, case in point. 20 years ago, its trade with China was about $3 billion. As of last year, $7 billion. The direct flight between two countries, between North Korea and its most important country in the world, China, was five times per week. Last year, still five times per week. So this presents a very complex and serious problem for all of us. How to deal with them, what the nature of this problem, how, what kind of keys do we have to open the door for the future? Fortunately, we have five eminent speakers 
who will elucidate the essential aspects of these subject problems. We have Thomas Berger from Germany and Chol Giju from Korea, Thierry Mariani of France, Marcus Roland from the United States, and Anatoly Drukonev from Russia. We will start with uh, Thomas Berger from Germany. He is currently head of the German Foreign Ministers, no, heads of Polish Planning of German Federal Foreign Office. Previously served as head of the German Foreign Minister's Office, and he served also as a political counselor in Ankara, Turkey, and in DC, the United States. Mr. Berger, you have the floor. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think we, we uh, heard a remarkable speech by the President this morning, but I'd like to draw your attention on a speech that she gave in the German city of Dresden uh, in former East Germany in March this year when she was on her presidential visit to Germany. And it was a lecture uh, titled An Initiative for Peaceful Unification of the Korean Peninsula. And she laid out uh, in greater detail some of the issues that she also touched upon this morning. And I think you know, the German-Korean relationship is far broader than the uh, rather superficial similarity of having a history of division. Um, but it's quite interesting that we come back to this issue uh, of division and unification on the Korean Peninsula. First, because the president has made it uh, a strong hallmark of her policy initiatives, but secondly also because there's a new dynamic um, in, in this intractable issue, uh, namely um, in the attitudes of, uh, of Beijing and of China. And I think that is something that, uh, that we should discuss and, and that there's a lot of uh, dynamic in the relationship between um, uh, Korea and, and China these days. Um, we have, though, set up um, an advisory group, um, Korean, German, to discuss and, and sort of reflect on the German and European experience, some of which has already been touched on in, this, uh, in the first panel this morning. Not because we think that there are lots of similarities. Actually, the differences between the Korean and the German experience are rather striking. And just to mention um, a handful of them, uh, the experience that there was a war between the North and the South on the Korean Peninsula, uh, and there was never a war between East Germany and West Germany. Um, the, the dimension of the experience of division, uh, we're talking 70 years now um, on the Korean Peninsula. We only had 40 years um, before reunification happened in Germany. Um, you're, when you compare the size of the population, you're talking two to one here, you were talking four to one in Germany. When you talk about the difference in GDP per capita, it was maybe, I don't know, three to five to one in the case of Germany, and you may talk about something that is closer to 15 or 20 to 1 in the case of Korea. And then finally, you know, maybe the most important issue of all that has already been mentioned is the nuclear dimension, of course, uh, which was not there uh, in, in the case of Germany. And as a final, remind, final reminder on the differences um, or on the sort of the unpredictability of what we're trying to address here as an issue, uh, uh, let us not forget that German unification, sort of the fall of the Iron Curtain and the wall um, in Berlin and Europe, came as an almost complete surprise at the time uh, 25 years ago. So given all of those differences in the overall situation, um, you know, why is it useful to even look at the European and the German experience as we've tried to do? Because the key question... The key question, how to build among the nations of the region the proper framework for peaceful political and social change, that is the same challenge that we were facing in Europe and for which we've tried to find um, our own solutions. And um, uh, uh, former Foreign Minister Han, who's chairing that group on the, on the Korean side, um, is, is sort of better placed uh, than me to talk about um, the reflections um, of that German-Korean group.
but I'll just name three sort of categories that are hugely important. One that the president has stressed and is sort of obvious in the way she frames uh, Korea's policies is the need to build trust. Um, and I, I think it's entirely appropriate to stress this point um, also, given uh, sort of the, uh, the Russian dimension um, of, um, of what we're facing as security challenges, we can talk for, for a long time about Ukraine uh, and eastern Ukraine and Crimea, but the larger dimension of the conflict is the loss of trust uh, that has been built over decades in Europe, and that, that is the real loss, and that is the challenge of rebuilding it in our part of the world, but it's also the challenge here. Second, pragmatic cooperation. Try to focus on pragmatic steps um, and, uh, and practical solutions in order to narrow the gap that divides South and North. Uh, and if you think about, if you reflect about the history of Ostpolitik in, in, in Germany and Europe, um, it took place over decades. It was very controversial at the beginning, also domestically controversial, but in the end, it became part of the continuity of German foreign policy. And I think this policy continuity and look at it as a long-term strategy is absolutely critical. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for your presentation. I think it's very important for you to underline the differences rather than similarities between the cases of Germany and Korea. Because when, from Korea's perspective, when it deals with North Korea, the most serious obstacle comes from North Korea itself, as Pyongyang is very much afraid of the contact with South Korea, the rapprochement, the interaction. That is the most important distinction, difference between Korea and German case. In the case of Germany, East Germany was eager to embrace and uh, uh, follow suit of the West Germany's overture for the rapprochement between the two Germanies. But in case of Korea, North Korea is still very reluctant, afraid of any gestures from South Korea because they see all of them as Trojan horse. But we have uh, an expert on this issue, uh, Chol Giju who served as ambassador to France, Morocco, and Mauritania, and currently uh, he serves as uh, uh, the senior advisor for foreign policy and security of the President of the Republic, Park geun And he will explain us, I hope, the current government's approach to the reunification policy and Northeast Asian question. Thank you very much, good morning. Uh, it is my pleasure to join such a distinguished uh, group of uh, speakers today. A larger context was already uh, explained by Madam President this morning, so in the capacity of myself, I'll give a brief lay on the land on the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia. Next year marks the 70th anniversary of the division of the Korean Peninsula, and uh, during those uh, seven decades, South Korea evolved into a vibrant democracy with one of the most dynamic economies. While North Korea has been undergoing deeper international isolation and economic dysfunction, not least because of its pursuit of uh, nuclear weapons, it is the people of North Korea that suffer most as a result. North Korea's new problem poses a direct threat to the security of all uh, uh, countries in the region and beyond. Left unchecked, uh, it could potentially jeopardize the entire non-proliferation regime. Over the last 20 years, collective efforts have been made to achieve North Korea's denuclearization, yet very little progress has been made to date. Whereas the P5 plus one continues to engage in intense diplomacy on the Iranian nuclear issue, the six-party talks is in its uh, sixth year of hiatus and counting. If we are to prevent the next uh, 20 years or the next 70 years <coughs> from being a repeat of the last 20, 20, 20 when North Korea was able to build up uh, its nuclear stockpiles, or the last 70 when South and North Korea faced each other off, we must be serious 
about taking a fresh and creative look at moving forward. The Korean government is pursuing a multi-pronged process, and we seek to restart the six-party talks while simultaneously pushing for direct inter-Korean dialogue with Pyongyang to cooperate in ways that would help lay the groundwork for our eventual reunification. Uh, these include the tackling uh, humanitarian challenges, ways to help improve the livelihood of ordinary North Koreans, and ways to restore a sense of common identity as one people. Uh, we will, of course, observe UN sanction in this process. And we also believe that North Korea's dire human rights situation must be improved and redressed. In this regard, we welcome the increased international momentum that this year has seen. At the same time, North Korea's provo provocations will be uh, firmly met, and for us it is very important to maintain a, a strong Korea-US alliance. Success in denuclearizing North Korea will offer a test bed for sp spurring progress in achieving the uh, in achieving broader non-proliferation goals around the world. Ultimately, as uh, Madam President has been saying, unification can be the silver bullet to resolving many of the key challenges that plague the Korean Peninsula, such as the nuclear issue, human rights questions, abuses, and North Korea's social and economic challenges. Our unification preparation committee has already been launched with a view to paving the way to unification, and we are working on that. And we deeply appreciate the support of our partners in the international community for ultimate unification of the peninsula. Our approach to the North Korean nuclear issue uh, could also be aided by a regional multilateral uh, security dialogue. For such a framework can help address insecurity in, uh, that North Korea might have about giving up its nuclear weapons. But the significance of regional uh, architecture in Northeast Asia would go beyond its uh, potential contributions to resolving the North Korean question. This region lies at the uh, intersection of the three largest economies in the world and has benefited tremendously from uh, globalization, open market. Yet historical and territorial tensions stand in the way, in the way of Northeast Asia's ability to unleash its full potential. A regional mechanism has the potential to mitigate uh, geopolitical tensions and rivalries in the region. The need for a regional architecture in Northeast Asia is widely recognized, not least by our partners in Europe who are at the avant-garde of regional cooperation. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon also stressed a similar point at last month's East Asia Summit in Myanmar. He pointed out that Northeast Asia remains the crucial missing link in UN engagement with regional or sub-regional organizations under the Chapter 8 of the UN Charter. He called on the region to explore creating a new security architecture and applauded the Korean government's initiative to fill this gap. Such regional mechanisms obviously don't come overnight. Habits of cooperation need to be cultivated, and it is easier to build up such habits of cooperation from soft issues rather than from hard security issues. As countries in the region get used to mutual collaboration in areas like uh, uh, nuclear safety, we have 100 centrals in the region already, disaster management, climate action, and energy security, narcotic issues, etc., they can develop a level of trust necessary for tackling more challenging political and security issues. Such multilateral cooperation in <coughs> Northeast Asia can also reinforce the momentum for progress on the nuclear front and in inter-Korean dialogue. A strengthened security dialogue structure 
in Northeast Asia can also interact with other regional groupings like ASEAN, ARF, ASEM as a way of uh, interregional cooperation to buttress world peace and stability. I hope that the uh, WPC can serve as platforms that generate support for filling the missing links, missing links of global connectivity. As North Korea continues to grow in geopolitical and economic importance, it is increasingly being looked upon to play one way or the other a greater role in tackling global challenges, be it the fight against climate change, contagious diseases, or terrorism. Until now, it has been the West that has widely been expected, expected to bear the brunt or lion's share of contributions for the global commons. Today, it is difficult to imagine uh, plausible solutions to global challenges that do not include Northeast Asia. And there is a cause for optimism. In the campaign against the Ebola virus, for instance, we see China making huge contributions in manpower and treasure following the leadership demonstrated by United States and key European countries. Japan is also providing sizable financial assistance, and Korea is following by stepping up to send health workers to fight the Ebola virus in West Africa. And during the course of time, we are very much helped by European partners. Likewise, Northeast Asian countries have recently announced significant steps to tackle global warming issue. Maybe East Asian countries can be mobilized to support the success at Paris Conference next December in terms of addressing climate change issue. Hence the role that North East Asia is expected to play and will be playing to meet the host of challenges facing humanity will likely grow. Indeed, North East Asia's cooperation is becoming increasingly indispensable to dealing with global issues and I hope to see it increase. As I mentioned earlier, Next year will mark 70 years since the Korean Peninsula was divided, but it is also an, an immensely symbolic year for virtually all the countries that are represented in this conference. And as the 70th anniversary of the end of our war that has shaken every corner of our world approaches, we see how every region continues to be beset with each own set of challenges. <coughs> this is not cause for despondence, but for renewed determination, uh, renewed determination to learn from the past and do more to improve our world. Only then will we be able to tell our children that the world is more peaceful, safer, better, and cleaner. Uh, then it was some 70 years ago. Uh, this is what we seek to achieve here on the Korean Peninsula and we count on your continued support along this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chu, for sharing with us <clears throat> Korean government's policy as well as perspective regarding Northeast Asia and North Korea. Next speaker uh, is Thierry Mariani de France, who is now currently French member of parliament for French citizens abroad and the co-president of the French-Russian dialogue. He previ previously served as the Secre Secretary of State and then Minister of Transport as well as, as a special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan of President Sarkozy. Monsieur Mariani, vous avez la parole. Thanks. Thanks a lot. As you said, I'm now a member of the French Parliament, elected for the French Live Overseas. We in a little constituency who start in Kiev and finish in New Zealand. That's why I have the opportunity to be uh, present uh, nearly each week in Asia, in Asia. And as a member of Parliament, I have the duty to speak in French. That's why I want to uh, congratulate the the Thierry de Montbrial for the organization and to make a French translation. Voilà, je disais... Euh, qu'à chaque fois au cours de mes déplacements 
je, je découvre cette énergie singulière qui a permis à ces pays d'atteindre un niveau de, déplacement, de développement que l'on connaît aujourd'hui et de devenir, comme vous l'avez dit, une région clé dans le monde. Les pays d'Asie du Nord-Est sont parvenus à, à s'affirmer sur la scène internationale grâce à leur dynamisme économique, à l'exception, bien sûr, de la Corée du Nord. Et la Corée du Sud en est un exemple. Depuis une vingtaine d'années, le pays est devenu une puissance économique majeure, un partenaire commercial significatif de l'Union européenne. Vendredi dernier, il y avait le dîner de la Chambre de commerce franco-coréenne à Séoul et le président me rappelait que pour la France, si on rapporte le commerce avec la Corée euh, à la population, ce commerce est nettement supérieur par rapport à la population à celui que nous avons par exemple, excusez-moi, avec le, le Japon. Cette performance est le fruit d'un certain nombre de choix économiques et de réalités sociétales, un pari très fort sur l'éducation, le choix d'une économie ouverte et tournée vers l'exportation et un haut niveau d'épargne et donc d'investissement. Ainsi, au regard de son dynamisme économique, de son insertion dans le commerce international et du niveau de vie désormais élevé de sa population, la Corée du Sud n'est bien sûr plus ignorée par les entreprises européennes. Nobobstant, la Corée du Sud a aussi à connaître les risques qu'implique l'intégration dans un système globalisé, c'est-à-dire un ralentissement de la croissance dû à la crise économique de 2009. Qu'il s'agisse de la Chine, de la Corée du Sud ou encore du Japon, ces pays exportateurs de premier plan n'ont pas été épargnés par la crise. Force est de reconnaître qu'il s'agit d'une zone interdépendante dont l'un des défis pour les années à venir sera notamment d'assurer la stabilité de la zone, et ce, malgré des tensions fortes qui persistent. Ces tensions, bien sûr, nous les connaissons. La géopolitique de la Corée est en effet au cœur même des enjeux de l'Asie du Nord-Est. Divisée depuis 60 ans, la péninsule coréenne en proie à des tensions, concentre l'attention de, de ses pays voisins, mais également, nous l'avons vu récemment encore, l'ensemble de la scène internationale. L'absence, par exemple, de Kim Jong-in en septembre dernier et le florilège de spéculations que cela a engendré sur la stabilité du régime nord-coréen, y compris de la part des démocraties européennes, est la preuve que l'avenir de la péninsule coréenne représente des enjeux bien au-delà de l'Asie du Nord-Est. Ces dernières années se sont succédées de part et d'autre des pays d'Asie du Nord-Est, des politiques plus ou moins enclins à une réunification des deux Corées, sans que bien sûr cela se concrétise. On peut en effet rappeler la politique dite de l'engagement menée par le président Kim Dae-jung de 1998 à 2003. Cette politique qui consistait à éviter l'effondrement économique de la Corée du Nord et à réintégrer dans la politique internationale, aurait pu contribuer à détendre le contexte géopolitique régional et donc à renforcer la sécurité de la région. Cette amorce de coopération pouvait même laisser entendre une réunification à la fin des années 90, mais comme chacun l'a vu, la situation n'a bien sûr pas évolué comme espéré. Lim Byung bak élu en 2008, a quant à lui mis un coup d'arrêt à cette politique. Pour autant, le retour à une politique de confrontation n'a pas entraîné lui aussi une dénucléarisation de la Corée du Nord. Aujourd'hui, nous le voyons, les relations entre les deux Corées sont euh, variables. Parmi ce que l'on aurait pu analyser comme le signe d'un dégel, on peut relever la visite à Inchun le 6 octobre dernier d'une délégation de Pyongyang à l'occasion de la clôture des Asian Games, en effet, cette visite laissait entendre le souhait de reprendre le dialogue bilatéral. On peut également citer la première rencontre depuis 2007 de hauts responsables militaires nord- et sud-coréens le 15 octobre dernier. Mais parallèlement, certains faits nous rappellent la persistance de tensions. Le dégel n'a donc pas eu lieu et la question nord-coréenne n'est, semble-t-il, bien sûr, toujours pas résolue. La scène internationale, malgré certaines sommations, n'apparaît guère plus apte pour apaiser les tensions. Et du côté de la Corée du Nord, on peut constater une capacité de résistance. Personne ne sait exactement, bien sûr, quel est le soutien réel du peuple au régime nord-coréen, mais euh, le traumatisme d'une guerre fratricide et le souvenir des décennies de division de la nation sur fond de guerre froide font que, finalement, 
petit à petit, cette division s'est installée dans certains esprits. Ces différents en Asie du Nord-Est, y compris les litiges territoriaux et historiques, doivent être bien sûr gérés et résolus pacifiquement. Des tentatives de dialogue et de négociation existent. En effet, à la suite de la crise d'octobre 2002, durant laquelle un programme de développement d'armes nucléaires a été découvert, ont été lancés en 2003 les pourparlers à 6, réunissant les deux Corées, les États-Unis, le Japon, la Chine et la Russie. Ces discussions avaient pour ambition de trouver une issue pacifique aux problèmes de sécurité soulevés par le programme nucléaire nord-coréen. Sans véritable succès, puisque la Corée du Nord a poursuivi son développement nucléaire. Aujourd'hui, différentes hypothèses peuvent être formulées pour un démantèlement du programme nucléaire nord-coréen. M. Chae Sung Chung, professeur du département des relations internationales à l'Université nationale de Séoul, a classé ces hypothèses en trois groupes. Les premières renvoient à une reprise des pourparlers afin de dégager des moyens pour démanteler les installations nucléaires nord-coréennes et exiger de Pyongyang la déclaration de tous ses programmes nucléaires. Le deuxième cas de figure se fonderait sur l'idée selon laquelle la Corée du Nord ne renoncera pas à ses ambitions nucléaires. Enfin, le troisième scénario consiste à minimiser les actions réciproques avec la Corée du Nord et attendre une réponse positive pour amorcer enfin des négociations fructueuses. Je voudrais ici développer rapidement le cas de figure selon lequel on assisterait à la reprise des pourparlers. En effet, il me semble que malgré les difficultés des premières tentatives, les pourparlers à six, comme les négociations multilatérales, demeurent incontournables. Même si ces négociations n'ont pas atteint le but escompté, ces négociations étaient à l'arrêt depuis avril 2009, à la suite du retrait de la Corée du Nord, elles ont permis une approche pragmatique. Dans l'hypothèse d'une reprise des pourparlers, les États présents à la table des négociations auront non seulement pour mission d'établir un processus de dénucléarisation, mais avant tout intérêt à diversifier les sujets de négociation. Le cadre de pourparlers assis peut être l'occasion, comme le précédent orateur vient de le dire, d'ouvrir de nouvelles négociations autour d'autres questions régionales, comme par exemple les questions maritimes, la protection de l'environnement ou l'intégration économique. Autrement dit, même si ces pourparlers ne sont pas aujourd'hui dissuasifs pour mettre un terme aux essais nucléaires nord-coréens, ils doivent être un levier pour créer un dialogue et pour renforcer la coopération en matière diplomatique, économique ou militaire. C'est d'ailleurs une des stratégies évoquées par le secrétaire général des Nations Unies à l'occasion du sommet de l'Asie de l'Est le 13 novembre dernier. Il a en effet rappelé la nécessité pour les pays asiatiques d'élargir leur coordination et d'étudier la création d'une nouvelle architecture de sécurité pour une coopération régionale plus étroite et bien sûr en particulier en Asie du Nord-Est. Une reprise des pourparlers est d'ailleurs plausible. Le 25 novembre dernier, l'envoyé spécial du dirigeant nord-coréen et le président russe Vladimir Poutine sont tombés d'accord pour accélérer les efforts visant à relancer les pourparlers à 6 sur le programme nucléaire de Pyongyang. Le représentant de Séoul dans ces négociations s'est lui aussi rendu en Russie la semaine dernière pour discuter de la situation sécuritaire dans la région avec son homologue russe. Ces pourparlers constituent également pour les autorités chinoises un dossier majeur. De toute évidence, en conclusion, la transformation de la Corée du Nord et son intégration à la communauté internationale, si elle doit se faire, sera bien sûr progressive. Selon le professeur de l'université de Yonsei, Chung In Moon, la transformation graduelle de la Corée du Nord et son intégration à la communauté internationale devrait être encouragée. Un des leviers à encourager est celui justement des liens économiques. On constate qu'entre la Chine et le Japon, malgré des différents que chacun connaît, le pragmatisme économique l'emporte. Les tensions politiques n'ont en effet pas mis fin à l'intensification des échanges. Certes, les liens économiques n'imposeront aucune convergence politique. Toutefois, ils peuvent constituer un moyen pour rapprocher les pays d'Asie du Nord-Est, et notamment la Corée du Nord, qui aujourd'hui ne prend pas part au système global que nous connaissons. Ce qui est de moins en moins exact, ce qui est d'ailleurs de moins en moins exact, pardon, puisque la Chine entretient avec la Corée du Nord des relations économiques qui se sont renforcées depuis le début des années 2000. Les échanges économiques entre les deux Corées se sont également développés. 1,8 milliard de dollars en 2008 
faisant de la Corée du Sud le deuxième partenaire commercial derrière la Chine. En conclusion, je disais, la péninsule coréenne est toujours un véritable enjeu pour l'avenir de l'Asie du Nord-Est. La perspective de réunification coréenne, certes peut-être lointaine, mais toujours envisagée selon des scénarios plus ou moins brusques. Je dois dire, pour en discuter avec les parlementaires coréens que j'ai eu l'occasion de rencontrer, que par moments, la volonté ne semble pas forcément ni l'enthousiasme évident. Des, un apaisement entre les deux pays et les relations pacifiques sont bien sûr unanimement souhaitées, mais la réunification semble aussi inquiéter, je pense, des deux côtés, puisque si la réunification allemande s'est faite, euh, j'allais dire, euh, avec un certain temps, mais avec un fossé économique certainement qui n'était pas celui que nous connaissons entre les deux pays. En attendant, le retour à un climat de guerre froide ne serait pas le meilleur vecteur pour rapprocher Nord et Sud. Mais il ne faut pas sous-estimer, je pense, la capacité de survie du régime nord-coréen. Par conséquent, attendre l'effondrement du régime nord-coréen et renoncer au dialogue avec la Corée du Nord conduirait inévitablement à l'affrontement, alors même que les perspectives de dialogue restent toujours possibles. Merci. Merci, M. Mariani, pour votre exposé. On retient deux points de votre présentation. Premièrement, l'Asie de l'Est à nord-est est une région clé dans le monde. Deuxièmement, la division de la Corée, euh, qui ne montre pas des signes de rapprochement tangible et significatif, avec Pyongyang, <coughs> qui maintient toujours les programmes de désarmement nucléaire, reste l'enjeu de l'Asie de l'Est et au-delà. Merci bien. Now we have uh, Marcus Noland from the United States. Uh, Marcus served, he is now currently executive vice president and director of studies of the Patterson Institute. Previously, uh, he was a senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors in the office of the president of the United States. He wrote uh, numerous articles on Northeast Asia and the Korean Peninsula and gave lectures at the Yale University and Johns Hopkins and other forums. Monsieur Nolan, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be invited to participate in this gathering. South Korea is the development success story of the last 50 years. 50 years ago, this country was poorer than Mozambique or Bolivia. Today, it is richer than Spain or New Zealand. And last night at dinner, one of my French colleagues predicted that it will catch France within 10 years. Please, please keep in mind that was the prediction of a French colleague, not my prediction. As spectacular as South Korea's economic development has been, uh, its political development has been as impressive, if not more so. In a period of roughly 10 years, between 1987 and 1997, it went from leadership passing from a military authoritarian strongman to his elected but hand-picked military successor to an elected centrist civilian politician to a former dissident getting elected president. And these accomplishments on both the economic and political fronts have been recognized internationally. As was alluded by a previous speaker, uh, a South Korean national is now the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. South Korea was the first Asian and first non-G7 country to host the G20 summit. South Korea hosted the uh, second nuclear summit. Uh, a truly impressive history of accomplishment. If you want to see a contrast, look north. North Korea is mired in the third generation of a Stalinist dynasty. As President Park uh, remarked in her speech this morning, it was the subject of an absolutely devastating, comprehensive 400-page report by UN Commission of Inquiry into its human rights abuses, which led the General Assembly to recently recommend referral of the regime to the International Criminal Court. Its economy is characterized by growing inequality and corruption. It experienced one of the worst famines of the 20th century, and even now a significant part of its population uh, remains chronically food insecure. Looking forward, the best case uh, option for the United States is the peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula on Seoul's terms. The questions are how we get there, under what conditions should we settle for second best alternatives. 
a permanent division of the peninsula is clearly a possibility. But when people think about unification, it basically boils down to three scenarios. First one is one side conquers the other one militarily. The second one is that the, the peninsula experiences a peaceful, gradual, consensual unification, which is measured in decades. And that's the official position of the two governments. The third possibility is the one that's usually talked about the most, which is an abrupt German-style collapse of the North and its absorption by the South. Uh, normally, the uh, Korean equivalent of the peaceful disappearance of East Germany is assumed, but there are no guarantees, and I'll come back to this point in a moment. Now, the first possibility is horrific, and given the maintenance of deterrence on the peninsula that has prevented large-scale conflicts for, 50 year, for 60 years, hopefully it will not eventuate. That leaves the second and third possibilities. Which of these two scenarios, and a prolonged consensual unification or abrupt collapse and absorption scenario prevails, revolves around whether North Korea can successfully address its economic, political, and diplomatic challenges and uh, survives uh, permanently as an independent uh, political entity, or whether multiple stresses that the regime confronts uh, uh, creates an unmanageable situation and it experiences an abrupt change culminating by absorption by South Korea. Now, earlier this year, the Ilman Institute of International Relations surveyed 300, uh, excuse me, 135 experts, a term I use advisedly in this context, uh, with respect to the future of North Korea. Obviously, there was a range of views among this multinational cast of experts, but the consensus from this survey was the life expectancy of the Kim Jong-un regime was something on the order of 10 to 20 years. A majority expected it to fall from an internal power struggle and that unification with South Korea would be the final endpoint. This implies that the consensus, among the experts at least, is towards that abrupt unification scenario. Now, with respect to that scenario, establishment of civil order is essential, as the U.S. learned or was reminded in Afghanistan and Iraq. If there is prolonged violent political uh, opposition to South Korean rule, then a quarantine or something akin to the situation with respect to Israel and the West Bank Gaza uh, territories uh, uh, could obtain, and the predictions on the economic side of subsequent development of the peninsula would obviously be dampened or attenuated. The good news is that recent planning by the South Korean government uh, shows a new sense of seriousness, and unification would accelerate peninsular growth and lead to a dramatic reduction in poverty. The bad news is that the price tag could easily exceed a trillion dollars, or less, as the South Korean government planning assumes, if the DMZ is maintained as a mechanism of population influx control, permitting very disparate levels of per capita income in the two parts of the peninsula for an extended period of time. But that scenario itself raises political issues that I will skip over in the interest of time. Ultimately, the key determinant of which of these scenarios eventuates is the capacity of the North Korean leadership. And the rest of the world, and that means all of us, um, can influence incentives at the margin, but we should not exaggerate how much influence we have on these internal developments. In this respect, the key issue for us, and especially for South Korea, is how we frame engagement. And South Korean political history provides alternative conceptions. As was alluded to by uh, my predecessor, uh, President Kim Dae-jung had a policy called sunshine policy derived from the Aesop fable of the, sunshine, of the sun and the wind. Uh, they bet on who can make the traveler disrobe. The wind blows and blows, but that only makes the traveler uh, cover up more tightly. The sun warms the traveler. He takes off his robe. The key, ish, the key point here is that the sunshine policy was, an, was conceived as an instrumental policy. Kim Dae-jung didn't want to pursue sunshine with North Korea because he was very nice or he liked North Korea. He wanted to pursue it to transform North Korea in a way that would make national reconciliation more feasible and ultimately set the stage for uh, unification. His successor government, uh, the government of uh, uh, President uh, No Moon Hyun, drifted into a different conception of engagement, a conception of engagement where the point of engagement was engagement for engagement's sake. And the idea was that if you engage with North Korea, um, it, it would feel less humiliated, it would feel greater status, it would 
have less likelihood of lashing out as a result. And so engagement is a kind of reassurance that turns the heat down and permits co peaceful coexistence. For this line of argumentation to be persuasive, uh, in the case of Han, one has to have in mind some sort of turning point in North Korean behavior uh, so that uh, these uh, handouts are justifiable appeasement and not simply uh, self-destructive enablement of a hostile state. And North Korean threats of a nuclear first strike against the United States uh, make this line of reasoning hard to sustain. Uh, diplomatically, nor for that matter is the South Korean public willing to go along with a one-way street of, uh, of handouts anymore. So we're back to a, a world of reciprocity, and the issue is how we should structure engagement, and President Park this morning outlined her policy of trust politique, uh, which recognizes this domestic political imperative explicitly. The goal of engagement should be to encourage the evolution of the North Korean state in desirable directions, encouraging less threatening and bellicose uh, behavior externally, uh, less, uh, less repressive practices internally, while encouraging the rehabilitation of the North Korean economy as a hedge against possible collapse. The answer of which uh, to the question of which of these concepts of engagement will prevail, uh, whether it is a means to an end or an end in the, of itself, will impact not only the nature of North-South relations, but the relations of each respective state's relationship with the United States, relationships in Northeast Asia more broadly, and um, ultimately uh, the uh, future of North and South Korea themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos, for presenting with those two scenarios, very clear, uh, of the possible evolution of North Korea. The first one is prolonged but peaceful process of integration. The second one, uh, reunification by default, in other words, by the collapse of North Korea. And particularly, I advise you to take note that his uh, explanation that we should not exaggerate the level of influence we can possibly have a North Korean evolution. And next, uh, we unfortunately do not have any representative from Japan nor China, but we do have from Russia, uh, Mr. Anatoly Turkunev, who is a diplomat and scholar. He serves currently as rector of the Moscow Institute of International Relations and president of the Russian International Studies Association and also is the chairman of the Russian co-chairman of the Russian Japanese History Commission. Mr. Anatoly, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Church. Uh, you know, all these talks about uh, the resumption of dialogue between uh, two careers, about the new measures taken uh, by all sides involved in this process brought my memory back to the 1972. Uh, that time I worked in our embassy in Pyongyang, and it was my first diplomatic position on the graduation of the university. And uh, I remember uh, that time because we were so happy to know that the joint statement of North and South Korea was signed in summer 1972. And there were a lot of hopes. And we think about very bright perspectives for the Korean Peninsula and for both uh, Koreas. By the way, uh, at that time we didn't have the diplomatic relations with South Korea. And uh, many of us dreamed to go to South Korea and to work uh, there and to know this country because we read a lot uh, uh, about the reforms of South Korea taken by the uh, president, uh, by President Park Chung-hee that time in the 60s and early 70s. So uh, much water has flown under the Han uh, River bridges since that time, but unfortunately we again and again uh, come back to the same topics. Uh, and uh, we speak about the resumption of dialogue. Uh, and uh, I should say that the current reality is much more complicated than in the Cold War era. 
then the security in Korean Peninsula was more or less uh, guaranteed by the antagonistic nuclear superpowers. Now we can witness a complicated interplay of uh, controversial national interests, both of big and smaller powers, each playing its own part in this geopolitical play. Korean Peninsula remains the hub of bilateral, regional, and global problems. The major players are the two Koreas and the four powers. The two Koreas remain the major actors with totally incompatible priorities. The inter-Korean relations follow a repeated turn. A crisis gives away to Ditang, which in turn is replaced by another surge of hostilities. We used to assume that the Korean War of 1950-53, which formally has not ended, started initially as a civil war between the competing elites, but later the two sides were supported by outside forces and conflict remains international till today. The essence of inter-Korean relations remains unchanged. The goals of Korean War remained unfulfilled for both parties, and each believes that the only complete victory over the enemy and its capitulation can put it to end. In uh, Park Kyung-hae, uh, Kim Jong-un era, no major breakthrough is on this side. Although the policy of Seoul became more balanced, while North Korea, after an, an outbreak of tension uh, in uh, 2013, also calmed down. However, even now, the intentions of both sides still remain incompatible. Pyongyang wants South Korea's large-scale assistance, which could strengthen the regime without any conditions, especially a condition concerning Pyongyang's right to security, so to say, emanated in nuclear deterrent. Seoul, uh, through its trust politic, pursues the goal of controlling the situation and opening up North Korea while softly inducing changes in the northern uh, society in preparation for the eventual fall of Kim's family regime and the unification of South Korean terms. The pretext of prior denuclearization and the meaningful steps puts, in my view, a cap on any practical steps to cordially improve uh, relations. At the same time, Pyongyang remains deeply suspicious about South Korean motives and, of course, cannot be expected to yield in principal issues of preservation of its governance system. In fact, the fact that both Koreas share ideas of nationalism and want to solve their problems without outside interference gives some hope for the future. However, the international dimension of Korean civil war in early 1950s resulted in a situation in which the two Koreas cannot settle their scores independently without great powers intervention. Although the extent of great powers interest is different, and let me elaborate uh, a little about the position of two countries, USA and Russia. USA remains the principal actor in the Korean Peninsula region, and uh, uh, Washington currently preferred a policy of containment of North uh, Korea, so-called strategic patience, while keeping strong political and military grip on South Korea. A new testament of US desire to keep rock under control and limit its foreign policy uh, maneuverability is inclusion of rock into deployment of terminal high attitude area defense systems aimed against China and Russia. For United States, the geopolitical motivation is of primary importance. The growing efforts to contain China is the most obvious reason for giving attention to Korean issue. International recognition of a party regime and normalization of the situation on the Korean Peninsula would put in question the U.S. military presence in the region and the creation of missile defense system in Northeast Asia. The Obama administration has not developed an articulate strategy with regard to North Korea. Uh, yesterday in, in, in the plane, I uh, read comments on the uh, recent visit of a new appointed special envoy in Korea, Mr. Sang Kim. And uh, uh, from these comments, I understood that uh, nothing new was brought to Korea, no, new ideas, new proposals, new initiatives. 
uh, this is in turn fits the fears of North Korean elite that uh, Washington is hoping uh, for a cataclysm in North Korea and its absorption into South Korea or a leadership change that would make Pyongyang more malleable. As uh, for Russia, for Russia's stability and pre prevention of a conflict in it, its uh, eastern frontier, which could lead to tectonic changes in geopolitical situation, is the utmost priority in its Korean policy. Therefore, all other considerations and priorities should be considered secondary to this agenda. Unfortunately, it's questionable whether the goal of denuclearization of North Korea is attainable for the moment. So any diplomatic process is only a tool to hedge the risk, stop North Korea improvement it, uh, its arsenal and prevent nuclear pro proliferation. Of course, North Korean uh, nuclear weapon uh, program and uh, YMDE proliferation issues are vital and should be solved but not at the cost of stability. However, there is no need for North Korea to use these missiles once her relations with these countries are normalized and Pyongyang's possession of these dangerous weapons is not a worst-case scenario if responsibly handled. At the same time, the non-proliferation issue cannot be suitably solved without addressing broader security issues. Russian experts believe that the North Korean a quest to get nuclear weapons resulted from the situation that during the Cold War, Korean security was guaranteed by the superpowers. The collapse of the Soviet Union led to a dangerous loss of equilibrium on the Korean Peninsula to the extent of the possibility of the use of force. Uh, potential reforms in the neighboring country constitute a chance for Moscow to improve its position in Northeast Asia, strengthen the role of Russian business in regional projects important from the geoeconomic and geopolitical points of view, such as a gas pipeline to South Korea via territory of North Korea and the Trans-Korean Railway connected to Trans-Siberia. The reforms uh, would contribute to implementation of these projects and they, in turn, to the stabilization of the economic situation in North Korea. As you may know, Russian North Korean relations are playing a very important role in strengthening its position in uh, Northeast Asia. Uh, deterioration of relations with Pyongyang has several times resulted in decline of Russia's influence in solving the problems directly related to its national interest. Russia has always stood firm that North Korea legal interests should be absorbed and this country should not be uh, the object of uh, isolation. I believe uh, the agenda of diplomatic process should be comprehensive and not be concentrated uh, solely on North Korean nuclear problem, but address comprehensive security issues, including that, that of the North Korean and uh, normalization of relations between all the parties. The uh, solution to the Korean issue could also be found through political and diplomatic means, preferably uh, within a uh, multi-party diplomatic process, which should not be regarded as a zero-sum game. A new security system in and around the Korean Peninsula should take into account the legitimate interest of all the parties. Uh, for example, a new concept of maintaining peace on the Korean a peninsula based on a system of cross-agreement among all six parties process participants can be suggested as a final result of the six-party talks. Such a system would legally secure each participant's rights and obligations toward other members in regard to the situation uh, on the Korean Peninsula and would make it possible to uh, monitor the fulfillment of these obligations. In this case, the implementation of bilateral obligations arising, for example, from the agreement uh, between North Korea and the United States uh, would be a subject to monitoring by such countries as uh, China and Russia. In turn, in turn the relations between uh, the ROC and the United States uh, could be under observance by uh, North Korea. Such a system could incorporate obligations stemming from the existing agreements with regard to the Korean Peninsula. 
the issue of denuclearization of North Korea could be resolved with uh, this uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you, Anatoly, for sharing with us your thoughts. One can particularly appreciate your presenting the crux of the matter of the inter uh, integrated relationship. You explained that North Korea wants a large-scale assistance from South Korea to strengthen its regime. On the other hand, South Korea wants a rapprochement with North Korea, even providing large assistance with a view to changing its strategy and its society. So there is a sort of bad luck. We also take note of explanation about the, the nuclear issue. This question is not a standalone issue. It is linked to the larger regional security as well as North Korean question itself. I'd like to thank the, the five panelists for having presented their uh, views in a very succinct and, and clear manner. And the upshot is we have 15 minutes for exchange with the floor. So unless you, each among you, you want to, would like to react to some comments, I'd like to open the floor to the audience. So you have the floor. Uh, raise your hand and microphone will be brought to you. Please identify yourself. Philippe uh, Chalmin. <clears throat> Un petit peu comme dans le débat précédent, j'ai trouvé curieux que l'on ne parle pas de la Chine. Il me semble que si le mur est tombé il y a 25 ans, c'est parce que l'URSS s'était effondré. Or, le parrain de la Corée du Nord, il me semble que c'est toujours la Chine. Et que tant que la Chine conservera avec la Corée du Nord des relations quasi filial, euh, il n'y aura pas de place pour une évolution du régime et donc pour une réunification. C'est une question, bien entendu. Excellent question. Je, je crois que uh, Herr Bagger, in a way, he explained, uh, respond to your question, anticipating, because he addressed the differences between Germany and Korea. And he said that in case of, and I, I edit my points of view, the difference between Germany and, and Korea is for German unification, Soviet Union hold the key, held the key. On the other hand, in case of Korea, it is not China, it is North Korea which holds the key. So would you like to react to his question? Herr Bagger, you, and Ambassador Cho. Well, I, I, you know, I would second that point. I think there is quite an interesting development in the in the Chinese, not in the Chinese appreciation or non-appreciation of what is going on in North Korea, and therefore a dynamic also in the South Korean-Chinese relationship. Um, but uh, I would also agree that, of course, there is a difference. Sort of, China plays a hugely important role for what happens in North Korea and what happens on the peninsula but it does not hold the key in the sa to the same degree as the Soviet Union did in 1989 to what happened in, in Germany and in Europe. So both of these things are important, but I'm not in a position to talk about sort of the Korean-Chinese relationship. There are others here who should do that. Excellent. Ambassador Chu. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the ties between uh, North Korea and China remain very strong, and China hopes to see uh, prolonged uh, stability uh, and security in the region. And uh, China does not want recurrence of a conflict, armed conflict in the region, in the vicinity. Uh, on the other hand, South Korea has uh, strengthened its ties with uh, China very deep. And uh, the, we are uh, very uh, strong economic partners. We have uh, s s Korea, China, FTA recently announced, and many other things, many, uh, many summit-level meetings and uh, quite closer contacts and conversations. Uh, what has changed in China is that uh, China doesn't want North Korea possess or develop nuclear weapons. And China, as, a, as others, as P5 member of the Security Council, cannot pardon uh, another uh, state to develop nuclear weapons because uh, one must uphold the uh, principle of non-proliferation 
and MPT regime. So that makes uh, uh, the relations between North Korea and China a little bit chilly at the moment. But I think uh, in solving this problem and resolving uh, this conflict, we, we need to console each other. And we are in close contact. And as some already mentioned, our negotiated strolling around, and my, part, my colleague went, to, for example, recently to Russia, China also, now, and our experts are in Japan. So uh, the, among the stakeholders, the constant contact, and absolutely finding a solution or finding a permanent solution, which is unification, we need to rely on Chinese support. And I think uh, China has no difference in that uh, approach. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more questions from left side. But if someone has a question from right side, you have the priority for the sake of balance. Please. I thank you very much, Tatsuo Masa from uh, Japan. I have a question to Ambassador uh, Zhu. There is a there is a rumor in in everywhere that in today's world of uncertainty, the nuclear umbrella of the United States over some part of Asia may not last forever. Some some Asian countries have a wish to have their own weaponry system based on nuclear. And some cited South Korea may wish to have North united without giving up nuclear capability because that could be a last resort for safety even without the nuclear coverage of the United States. Is this rumor just a rumor or any, any subtle feeling to do with this in South Korea? Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a complete rumor and groundless rumor, then maybe, uh, I don't know, promoted by some. Uh, 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 but uh, frankly, uh, as, uh, while North Korea is developing nuclear weapon origin region, we are developing our own policy for non-proliferation. We are now negotiating with the United States of uh, <laughs> prolonged the new type of nuclear agreement, and we want to be uh, one of the model champion of non-proliferation. So even though in Korea we have few people who may emphasize that we must have uh, enrichment right uh, in terms of having new nuclear agreement with the United States, but that is not the general notion of the Korean public and the Korean government. We want to uphold the principle of non-proliferation and stick to that point, and we want to be a model country in promoting peaceful uses, <coughs> respecting the rules of NPT and the IAEA. So uh, there's no doubt, and uh, uh, if there is unification sometime, we hope very much it will be done peacefully. And if still there is something remaining in North Korea about nuclear device, then it has to be carried away by, by responsible members of the Security Council. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't think there is any doubt on that. And uh, we really hope uh, we should not develop uh, our logic into that wrong direction. And let us unite our forces in preserving the current MPT system. Thank you. Thank you. Left side, middle of the left side, please. And then in front. Merci beaucoup. Serge Surf de Paris. Je voudrais poser une question tout à fait naïve, euh, et je crois qu'elle peut s'adresser à l'ensemble des membres du panel. Qui souhaite la réunification de la Corée <laughs> Ambassador Chu, you must respond to that question. Well, mostly myself, uh, I think uh, in Korea, uh, larger public wants to realize unification because we have been one country for the past 2,000 and some, of, some more years. And uh, so uh, 70 years is very long. And, uh, and uh, by emphasizing the uh, so-called unification bonanza or whatever, uh, in Korean we call it debug, the big bonanza, uh, we may do that, and uh, suddenly it arouses public attention that unification is something uh, which you should not be afraid of, which may create further dynamism for Korea's continued growth and uh, make the region prosper together. So I think a larger public in Korea supports that notion, but I don't know whether our friends uh, share the same viewpoint, but for Korean sake, we are there. We have this new preparatory committee preparing 
uh, constant work, and they got a very much support from the public. Thank you. In front, left side. Uh, Fen Hampson from Canada. I wonder if the uh, two Korean members of uh, the panel could comment on the stability of public attitudes towards what have clearly been oscillations in policy uh, from the sunshine policy to cooling, uh, now a policy based, as we heard, more on reciprocity. Is the public behind it? And when there's disappointment, as there may well be, uh, how do you manage that? I think, again, Ambassador Zhu is the obvious person to respond to that question. Before him, can somebody from the panel would like to address that issue? Marcus? I would be happy to address two of the other questions that have been asked, but I, I, I'm not an expert okay. on uh, South Korean public <laughs> opinion. Okay, Ambassador okay. Chu. So very briefly, uh, before we had the uh, five-year five -year progressive government, progressive uh, uh, which supports sunshine policy and the carried over policy. Then we have uh, another, you know, very conservative government. Now we have a second conservative government. Now we launched the so-called uh, Unification Preparatory Committee, where the, uh, 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 the uh, participants in that committee are largely from conservative element, but there are a few people, uh, a few people, uh, several people representing other uh, in a wave of opinion. So uh, uh, astonishingly we find uh, that we found uh, that there is a good consensus emerging out of this uh, preparatory committee. And uh, I think uh, I'm very much hopeful that uh, uh, this committee may play a central role in collecting public opinion or national opinion uh, to the right direction so that we can have a more easier access to difficult issue, uh, which is the unification issue and strategy issue, uh, strategic issue of talking with North Korean uh, partners. So uh, overall, I think uh, we are more positive in that direction that we might, we might consolidate public opinion into right direction, which is, having, uh, hope, which is working for peaceful unification, gradual unification, and uh, prepare the groundwork for supporting uh, both government and parliamentary viewpoints on uh, unification thank, palace. Thank you. Perhaps we can entertain one last question before you adjourn for lunch. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, today, as we know, economy dominates the politics. Uh, keeping this in mind, uh, are we fearing from China or can we ignore China if we are thinking about reunification or unification process? My, my, uh, my suggestion is, or my feeling is, if we involve the Japan, China, Russia, US, and if we initiate the unification process, is it possible? One, please comment on that. Second, uh, uh, keeping nuclear issue apart, keeping the other issues, uh, whether the development issue or the economic development or the other issues, is it possible uh, the unification will go ahead in that way? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any reaction from the floor, from the panelists? Yeah, Marcos, and I'd like to very much to listen from Ambassador Wu Jinmin, if you will, to answer that question as well, because it's directed to China. Well, well the, Marcos the, first. the absence of a Chinese representative from the sample, with all due respect to our hosts, I think is really a, a lacuna. Um, China has enormous influence on North Korea, and Chinese uh, attitudes and policies are absolutely critical. Uh, in my remarks, I referred to a survey by the Ilman Institute of International Relations. What's very interesting about that survey is that the Chinese experts surveyed have very distinct views relative to the non-Chinese experts. The non-Chinese experts saw China as the key to resolving the North Korean nuclear issue. They saw it Chinese pressure on North Korea is absolutely essential. And with respect to the question of who wants unification, they saw China as being the single biggest beneficiary from Korean unification. The Chinese experts, in turn, uh, view China as having much less influence on North Korea than the non-Chinese do. They think bilateral engagement by the United States is the key to resolving the nuclear issue. And what's really interesting, there is complete 
uniformity among these 135 experts that North Korea will not surrender its nuclear program for removal of sanctions or our economic inducements. Uh, the old idea that somehow this was a bargaining chip, that North Korea was simply going to negotiate away for, for a package of goodies. At this point in time, there is no, uh, there is no belief in uh, that theory or hypothesis anymore. Thank you, Marcos. Last intervention of this session, Ambassador Wu. Uh, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. I think we should not exaggerate China's influence over North Korea. Good example. We, we don't want North Korea to go nuclear. They just ignore our, our advice. We told them, what can assure is uh, your security is not a nuclear arsenal, but uh, development. When people are hungry with empty stomach, you can't have the security. They just ignore our advice. Other thing you see this year, my president chose to come to Seoul first. Uh, our North Korean friends are very much angry. <laughs> Not long ago, we hosted the Shangsan Forum in Beijing to talk about uh, uh, Asia security issue. On that issue, China, we, we believe, I think Richard Haas is right, in the Northeast Asia, uh, the, I mean in the Asia region, what is missing is uh, security architecture. I think we are, we, we are open-minded. We like talk, to talk about it. We invited uh, North Korea to participate in this forum. They declined the invitation. Many other countries join this forum. So the, I think the, the, this issue is quite complicated. We should not exaggerate the, the influence of China. I think what, what we can do together, I think international community, uh, US, Korea, China, Japan, Russia, we have to join hands to exert influence over North Korea to to lead them to give up nuclear arsenal. I don't see this prospect at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the five panelists for their brief and succinct presentations and audience for their attention. We will adjourn the meeting for lunch with former Prime Minister Lee Hong-gu. Thank you. <laughs>